Hi and welcome to episode 12 of Who's Zooming Who with me, Ken McCarthy, and joining me this week is a very good friend of mine, uh, Eamon Costello, who is the Head of Open Education at Dublin City University. Um, unusually, he's the second temporary man in a row um, that we've had um, on the show, um, but don't worry, I've, I've fixed, actually, no, I haven't. Oh, God, yeah, we have a temporary person next week, too. Uh, three, three in a row, it almost sounds like, a, like, like an achievement. Um, yeah, how did I manage to do that? Anyway, enough of that, enough of that. Over to Eamon. Eamon, you're very welcome to the show. Um, delighted to have you on here. Um, seems, seems strange to, to, to be talking so formally to, to uh, a, a long-term friend, but look, um, delighted to, to, to talk with you about all things online learning, a little bit about Springboard, and obviously, of course, COVID-19. Perhaps you'd like to just introduce yourself for, for the, the, the one or two people, uh, and I can't even believe there's that many, that, that, that don't know who Eamon Costello is. Uh, well, don't, don't believe everything you hear. I, I didn't do most of it. Um, so uh, thanks, Ken. So it's lovely to be here and uh, really looking forward to, to talking to you. Um, I don't really have anything to add in, in my introduction to say I suppose I work in, in online education, online learning for quite a number of years. Um, what people actually maybe don't know about me is that although I lived a good deal of my life in Tipperary, I was actually born in Dublin. So um, I'm, I'm a, a hybrid, a hybridity. The, the, I, I, I'd say you're just saying that for, for, for Tom Farley's purpose. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't believe it at all. But yeah, look, I, I suppose I, I, I claim half of Dublin heritage in that my mother was from Dublin. So, so DCU Connected is your, your brand that you rebranded as maybe four years ago, five years ago now at this stage? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, um, I guess it's, uh, it's like, a, we, we sometimes call it a, an online platform as well. So, um, and the idea by, by, by it is that it is about online learning, but we didn't want to use the language of online and so on. We wanted to use more of the language about what it is on a human level and it's about connecting people so it's DCU connected so even though you're online you are connecting with other individuals you're making connections you're you're building a network you're connecting with your teacher you feel like you're connected to your course to your subject and give people a sense straight away that even though they're studying online it's not some kind of deficit model they're not missing anything they're, they're gaining things there's a there's a, a pedagogy of, of a, um, abundance type of dimension to it, if you like, but it's, it's positive and it can, can really do good. Fantastic. And, and, and I suppose I, I probably should declare um, that uh, I'm a graduate uh, of DCU Connected myself, although it was, it was uh, I think, s still notionally Oscar when we started, but by the time we finished, uh, they had rebranded to, to, to DCU Connected. Um, I was very fortunate um, that coming back into education after a lifetime spent in industry, um, I was able to avail of Springboard um, to do a MSc with yourselves back in uh, 2013, I think it was now, or maybe, yeah, 2013. Mm. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, I know that mm. Springboard has just recently been announced again, and I think this year there's even more places than ever. Uh, I know it in our, ourselves in, in, in WIT, we have quite a number of courses, um, and a lot of them are moving online for the first time. Um, obviously, with yourselves, all of what you do is, is, is online. So maybe, you know, what, what, how's your experience been with, with Springboard to date or what is your experience with Springboard um, going forward? Um, well, I guess you, you mentioned yourself there, Ken. So that's a, that's a pretty inspirational story, as I understand it. You, you did a master's and you're, 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 you're laughing there out of nervousness, but maybe you could tell me a bit, a bit more about that. I'd love to hear about that from yourself. Yeah, no, um, uh, nervousness may be one side of it. Um, I suppose I was probably lucky in that I came back and uh, I worked in a family business that closed down in, in 2011 um, during the height of the last uh, recession. And hopefully we're not heading into another one. But um, And I found myself having to go back to education. And uh, in the first instance, I actually undertook a, a higher diploma in business and management that was a non uh, uh, on-campus uh, class um, with um, WIT uh, here in Waterford, indeed where I work now. And um, I suppose I, I, I enjoyed the experience so much, uh, I went looking for more, um, and I was 
being a, a sort of a online advocate um, in my general day-to-day -day life and having run an internet business prior to that, um, I wanted to, to do something online and that fit better with, um, with, with my sort of lifestyle. Um, and that's how I found the course with uh, DCU at the time. So I done the MSc in the uh, management of internet enterprise systems. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was it was tough. Uh, it, was a, it was an interesting year. Um, don't think I ever read as much or wrote as much uh, in 12 months. Um, but yeah, it was good. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, look at me now. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant story, Ken. It's, it's lovely the way it links up the different, you know, you, you did your, you started out there and you, you came with us and we gave you another kind of rung on the ladder, if you like, and another credential and you've got another award and it's a testament to your, to your get up and go. And like a lot of the, which framework at the height of recessions and, you know, the, the kind of head, the pretty bleak economic headwinds we're heading into is that it can help people get a job, so it can help them economically, but more fundamentally, so it can be really helpful to people's well-being and their just sense of self-worth to be studying and doing something and achieving things and feel like they're going somewhere when they're, you know, when they're down. Yeah, I know. Look, I probably hadn't thought of, um, I hadn't thought of the psychology of it in, in that level of depth, uh, and it's, it's interesting to hear it. Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, I knew that. Um, from a CV point of view, it was an obvious gap before I done the first level eight qualification, and obviously to get a level nine qualification was was even better again. Um, and uh, I was probably falling at the, the the first hurdle. You're right, of course, that the the the, the sense of accomplishment when you do anything like that is 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 wonderful um i love finishing things um i don't even mind starting things it's the bit in the middle um uh, is is usually um is usually where i go wrong but look um that says more about me than than yeah. it would ever say about uh dcu connected so your, your your platform at the time was 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 using uh moodle or loop as you call it in, in dcu um, yeah. backed up with online tutorials and and uh, copious notes and uh, a very strictly enforced schedule uh, i presume it's it's it follows generally speaking the same format uh, uh since so that's what 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 incoming students have to look forward to yeah, absolutely. And if, it's quite annoying now that you've managed to get to the same level as me. Well, I've got doctorates and all sorts of degrees in August institutions. There. So that's deeply annoying. So, but hopefully I believe you might be kind of heading down that road yourself. And I definitely encourage you to do so if you're thinking of it. Something we could talk about offline or something that was useful to you. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, the, the, if to answer your question, if it's how the model is evolving or, I mean, already, even though we were mostly online, We've obviously had made huge adaptations this year and we had to, we would have still had some face-to-face -face exams. So they all went online and there was lots of other aspects. And obviously we were remote working and for some categories of staff, that was kind of something they'd possibly been used to. Academics would be kind of quite mobile. They used to kind of working on a plane or a coffee shop in, in, in Brussels or something, but, um, uh, so that was all a big challenge that wasn't necessarily it hasn't affected the student experience negatively we found thus far that's that's what the, our students have been saying to us which is very um very hugely great to hear hugely heartening and we're very glad about that obviously they've been affected by the pandemic and the and the lockdown and the economic turmoil and the psychological effects of it all on people and the kind of work-life balance collapse <laughs> where you're you're in your your office is in your work and your work is in your office you have kids wandering into zoom calls and all sorts of stuff and the internet crashing because everyone's on minecraft or a zoom uh, conference you know um but uh you know it's a lot of my the students i'm directly teaching or supervising are uh, doing very well this year and they're doing they're doing really good and they're on track and obviously the big thing now will be um, for next year. We're already doing a lot of planning for that um, and seeing what, what uh, we can offer students and how we can support them and give them, get them onto suitable programs on the springboards. Um, 
and we've had some good success in in the call. That, but obviously, the, the pie is a lot is a, is, a, is roughly the same size, but a lot more institutions are engaging. As you pointed out, we we were in the space quite early, but it's a, it's an increasingly kind of competitive environment. So we're always thinking ways we can um, uh, do better and create more engaged and relevant offerings. And you know, how can we? Why? Why? What's our differentiator? It's what gives us the uh, digital edge to quote one of my uh, colleagues mark brown yeah I, I like that one digital edge sounds uh, digital edge sounds good uh, and as you mentioned um on zoom calls and people walk into the background yeah i, I think i've said this before I, I was clever enough to put myself up against the back wall of the house so i don't think anybody can walk behind me um <laughs> but but uh, you, you probably might have heard the doorbell ring a minute ago um the postman doesn't doesn't necessarily know what i'm recording these so um uh yeah you get you get all sorts of noises and i think I've, i have said definitely said it before that um my my, my next door neighbors decided this was a good time to get a dog that um <laughs> that does does tend to bark a lot um so uh, yeah. a lot a lot of my work meetings um have been punctuated by um, dogs barking on one side, and uh, I think on the other side, um, they decided to buy a trampoline for their very young kids. Um, so it's dogs are do, do, dogs are kids. But look, um, yeah. I, I guess that's part of part of um, the, the 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 new reality of um, it humanizes the whole thing a lot as well. Ken, you know, it's it's actually there's been some good parts to it that you know there's been a kind of realization that people that have these lives that are not. It's a bit artificial, in some senses, to just separate them off and go to work and come back. So it does give people a sense that people are involved in this rich experience outside of the kind of professional identity that you have to have at work. So it's, you know, that's kind of been a nice thing. Well, absolutely. I, I think I've seen the inside of more colleagues' kitchens um, <laughs> that, that I yeah. possibly ever wanted to see. But look, um, yeah. it, it's, it's nice to see them nonetheless. Um, yeah. And um, I, I've seen lots of very interesting bookshelves as well, just as just so you're not feeling left out there. Uh, yeah, I, you know. I was talking to a, a lecturer in um, DCU, we were chatting about online supervision and stuff, and she was supervising a student one time a couple of years ago, and she was chatting to him on Skype, and it was quite late, and uh, she was chatting away to the person, and it was quite late in the evening, you know, it could have been like 10 o'clock, whatever time it was, and uh, Next thing she says, uh, she heard um, this voice uh, saying, would you ever turn that off? And she realized that the person she was talking to was in bed with their partner on Skype. And the partner was like, can I just not get it? Can I get a bit of kick there, please? No, I, I suppose yeah, that 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 might be a bit uh, too close to the ball. I did hear right of, yeah. of, of, of a colleague of mine, her young daughter um, had figured out uh, how to set the virtual backgrounds um all right and had changed the virtual background to a video of herself kind of looking interesting uh right. or looking inter looking interested um okay. so kind of you know just looking at the camera and nodding occasionally and had all this right, on, right. and had this on loop and she said um the teacher will never know that i wasn't there because <laughs> um so yeah um and, and i think she might have been seven um so yeah so it's a, it's a it's a scary thought for 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 what our uh, our future students um will, will will be uh capable of and what they will have been exposed to so, yeah, you, yeah. so you mentioned there briefly about in terms of your own course i mean obviously um uh, your own courses they were all largely online anyway so um mm. i guess the expectation would be that sure for ye nothing changed it was all the same as usual but yeah you highlighted a couple of things that were, were very different there i mean assessment was obviously one would you like to expand on that maybe a little bit uh, around what were the challenges or or how we overcame the challenges or what were the yeah yeah we like the, the university like we were part of the wider university as well so that all we fold into everything that happens there and um so everything that happens on campus if that went online that's we, we were keeping in step with that as well and with the like the university came up with very very well developed um policies and guidelines and um you know we we moved uh very swiftly online as we have a whole section on our national institute for digital learning website about this and everyone it was kind of all hands to the pump right across the university from the kind of 
and people were leading from the very top, like people who wouldn't normally maybe get involved in day-to-day -day teaching were very getting stuck in and just saying, right, this is how we're going to run this. What are, what are these kind of, um, and what we articulated, which was very useful, and um, Professor Michael O'Neill, who's our um, Prometric Chair of Assessment, was, was leading out in some aspects of this, um, was articulating, and some of his colleagues as well, not just him, but I said, others, um, a set of principles around assessment. So what that was a, a start line. So like, what are the principles of, of assessment? What are we trying to do? Talking about reliability and validity, but also practicality and what the student experience was like and what, what outcomes we were trying to um, find and assess and what, you know, what your differentiated success criteria would be for different types of um, learning outcomes. Um, and that we had a whole load of um, a lot of detailed guides. There was a lot of people in the information systems uh, services, and my colleagues like Mark Lane and Rob and Suzanne and Claire and Fiona and all of the team in the TU and Karen and then myself, my own colleagues Orna and James and Mark and Rain and all the rest of the team. And Richard, I, I can't stop naming people now because I'm leaving people out, but. That's the danger when you start kind of name checking people. But we were all involved in all sorts of activities as well around kind of uh, mentoring people and helping them and not so much teaching them. Well, I was involved in some teaching myself in some online courses and mentoring, but more kind of listening to people and seeing what they needed and what they were doing and giving them reassurance or sometimes giving them guidance or saying, look, you know, this is what, this is where you could go with that. Um, because as you know, it's hard to um, make academics do anything. <laughs> it's you know there is there is the element of the uh, the famous animal husbandry, you know, with the the cats and the you know the bit of wagon pipe trying to round them up or whatever. So there's a lot of that feline uh, management. Um, so, but it was usually it was both really intense and kind of stressful and hard work. Um, but it was also hugely rewarding and it was kind of like right you're the guys who've been in online learning all the time now you're, you need to step up the time is here you don't be interested about what's going wrong and how bad you have it now's the time to, to help yeah no I, sometimes it can be uh, be careful what you wish for and, and, and all that because um <laughs> yeah. yeah um no look, look uh, some are all um of the kind of things you mentioned there were, were, were similar challenges um and, and i suppose stress points that that we had ourselves um and you know we wouldn't claim to have the 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 the, the depth um of experience uh, obviously that you would have yourselves um and, and it's it's great when you're naming out all your colleagues there um it's it's like a veritable who's who of the edtech uh, and online learning um industry in ireland um and i've often joked that i could probably have someone from dcu um, on on the podcast every week, and I still wouldn't run out of uh, of, of people to talk to. So, no, um, you've be, you've been fabulously um, inspirational, in fact, and and that online resource that you shared um, has been a, a real go to place for um, I know people um, right across uh, right across um, right across the country, and, and actually that's one thing that I will say um, even as recently as. Uh, this week and, and last, um, the amount of um, generosity um, that exists um, across uh, the, the, the higher education sector in yeah. Ireland with people sharing, um, look, this is what we're doing. Mm. You might be interested, you might not, but here it is anyway. Um, mm. that, that sort of old um, keeping everything to yourself um, mm. Uh, seems to have have has has evaporated in in the face of of the COVID nineteen crisis, and I think that's wonderful to see that 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 uh, openness and, and sharing of um, sharing of of uh, approaches, sharing of experience, sharing of materials. Um, it's been absolutely uh, absolutely amazing. Um, just just as a follow on question from that, and this is I, I don't know that maybe we haven't got to the point where. Um, this decision has been made yet, but you know you, you put a lot of thought um, and effort into changing what were very entrenched uh, processes for conducting end of semester terminal uh, exams. 
do you think that that work, okay, it was done for this one-off crisis that we find ourselves in. Do you think that that might lead to more fundamental changes in how uh, we assess students? Um, or was it just a, a, a one and done thing? It's, it's both, Ken, it's a dual track and the, both conversations are going on because there's remote emergency online teaching and then there's getting the space to reflect and say, well, what's the bigger, the bigger picture? As you say, the more fundamental thing we're trying to do here. And like, you know, what is proctoring? What is plagiarism detection? What, what is that about? What does that look like? What kind of services can we give to students? What kind of supports can we give them? And what kind of assessment do we want to kind of, what does what do the graduates we want look like and how can we fold assessment into educational programs that you know that give them the opportunity to become that person that graduate uh, and it's complex stuff you know a lot of the like there's a lot of kind of issues around like there's one of my colleagues who's newer to the team and he was we were trying to have regard to make sure that one of the principles we were following was that we have some equity of outcome that we wouldn't that students wouldn't feel they were disadvantaged this year compared to other years and that the outcomes would broadly look hopefully similar to what we would expect but this is usually complex thing when you think about it my colleague was like well, what should the, the the numbers look like in an exam and there's no easy answer to that question and i give you some thought experiments for example what about if and some people are very vigilant on kind of great inflation of these ideas, but the IUA had a nice response to that in previous years and they didn't think it was an issue. But um, if, suppose you have a class where everybody gets a first, right? So everybody's bunched up at the top. You've got 20 people in the class, they all got a first. A lot of people would say, that is insanity. That's not education. That's just giving everybody a badge, turns up or something. It's something's got to be wrong. There's got to be some differentiation. But another way of looking at that say, well, in theory, if you're a good enough teacher, you could take anyone and give them a first, if you were good enough. So another way of saying it is, well, you didn't do your job properly, you should now get firsts. And then people might say, well, people have different abilities. And you know, they're not going to have the same, they're going to get the same support, but come out with different things. But then are you saying to people at the start of a program of study, you can't get a first here. We know what your ability is and you're only going to get it to, to are you kind of foreclosing educational opportunities for people straight away by saying that it's impossible for everybody to get a first. It's a, it's a kind of scarcity mentality, if you like. And that's kind of inherent in a lot of systems, including in, in higher education. It's, it's a bit insidious. It's hard to kind of notice what these kind of effects can appear in, in lots of, um, areas of, of an academic structures and there's not easy answers I'm not saying like that's yeah no no I, 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 I uh, get exactly where you're coming from and um, I suppose I, I'd echo some of the sentiments in that um, you know I've had I've had lectures that um, in, in I, I won't name any of the, the, the institutions uh, but I've had lectures who have felt that 70 is the highest that anybody can get. So that threshold for a first is, so it, it's effectively been marked mm -hmm. out of 75 as opposed mm -hmm. to out of 100, which I always felt was desperately unfair. Um, we did have one, one lecturer come into a class once and said, um, as far as I'm concerned, you're all starting from 100. And we worked out from there. We asked, could we stop straight away? And, um, but he, <laughs> uh, he, did, he didn't want to do that, he didn't want to do that either. Um, I, I, I am uh, sometimes envious of um, I suppose that some of the the more absolute subjects like maybe accounting or where, where there, there's there is a right answer um, and you know it's it's notionally getting getting that mythical hundred percent is yeah. is is more possible uh, but, it's, but if there's a, if there's if there's a right answer if there's a hundred percent right answer and a hundred percent wrong answer. A machine could do that job. Yeah, yeah. Why does a human need to do it? Yeah. Adding. They, 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 um, but it, it is, um, I think exam results are, are always subjective. And I, and I remember some of my first experience of actually 
marking um, papers, um, it was the good ones I found harder to mark because it was um, harder to take marks away than it probably was to uh, yeah. than it was it's, to give them. It's they're... hardest to mark the ones that, that are are are, to, are in the at the high end and the low end. The ones in the middle are the easiest. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah. I mean, the other thing about marking S's and things as well is that like it's people's level of English now. We have a much more diverse country. When I came to college in, uh, I think, 1995 or something, Ireland was like the Dublin was the second whitest city in Europe or something because we were a poor country. No one wanted to come here or in the middle, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and if you got to Britain, you would just stick. You wouldn't twist. And we didn't have any colonies either, so we, we had to ask for the opposite. Um, but things have rapidly changed. And we now, and just because as well, we were a white country doesn't mean we were didn't have problems with racism. Of course, we had huge problems and huge all sorts of divisive problems, and we still do, um, including, of course, against white people such as travelers. But um, uh, I've noticed in my own kind of work now as well, like English language, the privilege of being able to speak English is not something that is is acknowledged and we're, we're grading and kind of rating people on their level of english a lot in, in the academy and it's complex how we kind of address this or understand this um and we've given we have with some support services in, in dcu for that we have this studiosity support service where students can get feed, formative feedback on, on the writing at any time it's good software things that also they, they can send in an essay and get feedback on it in 24 hours. Um, and the software, like Grammarly and stuff, that can help people a lot. Um, but uh, it's even, I kind of wrote about this, uh, probably something earlier in the year, like <clears throat> I, I got this feedback on a paper I submitted to a journal one time and it said, uh, requires proofing by a native speaker. Sounds like it. And the person Obviously, English wasn't their first language that gave me this feedback. And at the time, like, it was really annoying to get, to get this, you know, and it's kind of a trope. It's, it's almost like a standard to throw in. It's like, you know, needs more critical analysis or whatever. It's just a standard thing reviewers put in. But the deeper issue as well is that it's very, the language is kind of, it says that there's natives and they're kind of not, and obviously if there's natives, there's non-natives. And yet saying, by the way, you're a non-native and it's not... You know, just because you speak some other language, if you go home to talk to your family and, or, you know, you have your celebrations of whatever it is, or you sing your songs and you're struggling in a whole other language that someone else is telling you to use in order to get published and have impact in, in uh, research, but also in order to kind of access, succeed in education and access um, employment opportunities. Um, so that's just I'm rambling a bit there. But that's yeah, no, no, I, I, I understand uh, exactly where you're coming from. Now, I'm probably going to joke uh, as a throwaway comment and say that the non-native comment is probably because you're from Tipperary. But look, um, <laughs> we, 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 <laughs> I, I, I understand you. Um, uh, but, but I do, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And, and I think when you say native there, I mean, those of us in the online world have long kind of shaken off this idea of digital natives and digital immigrants. Um, the internet is a tool. Um, and you know, people will use that tool to to a greater or lesser extent, and uh, depending on how much they need it. So, um, I, I always use the example of of my late mother, who would have had zero interest in Facebook as a platform or a product until such time as she found out that this is where her grandchildren were, um, and then mm. suddenly became very expert in using Facebook because that's how she kept a track on what her grandchildren would do. Um, mm. So, you know, no more than technology being a tool, all, all languages is a tool for us to express ourselves. Um, and, and I think sometimes it can be very unfair. You know, if you're writing an article um, on a particular area of expertise and you're being pulled up on uh, grammatical errors, um, you know, if uh, no, I'm not saying that that you need necessarily give people a, a complete free pass either. Um, but if 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 the ideas are being articulated and expressed, uh, and the language is communicating what the author intends you to receive, should that not be enough? Um, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, people, and, yeah. 
you know, yeah. are, are, are we getting hung up a small bit on, um, on, on grammar? And look, language yeah. is a living thing as well. It, it's changing yes. uh, yeah. and, it, and it changes yeah. by use. And I'm not, look, uh, I'm not a, a grammar uh, expert um, or, or uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that um, some of the things I write sometimes could well be referred back to needs proofreading by a, by a native speaker uh, as well. Um, so it's it, it it is a tool, and it's it can be a sword. You know, the pen can be mightier than the sword, if you like. And uh, it's how we wield it, and what how we use language skillfully as well, or not in in giving feedback to students or to academic peers or whatever it is it's like you know how do you communicate in a, in a kind and respectful way when you can as opposed to like cutting through someone saying yeah this is you know. yeah because it it, it it sounds very much like a put down it sounds like a very much like a um a, a cheap uh, yeah. a, a, a cheap shot uh, for want of a better way of putting it it's interesting that that you bring that up and, and you, you talk about um how ireland has become a far more diverse country in in recent years uh, i know dcu were the first university of sanctuary i think if i've got that right um mm. you've had even a number of sanctuary students on your online programs uh, and obviously they're they're facing unique challenges that most of us would 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 struggle with um anyway never totally. mind uh, totally. take on take take on study in 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 oh, yeah. a, 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 a non to, to use the expression we just said we wouldn't use a non your non native tongue um yeah. so perhaps maybe just we could finish out by having a, a brief yeah. chat about that sure i'd be delighted um ken and thanks for me to that because that's one of the things that's on my mind to try and mention that we have these scholarships and people can apply for them or spread the word about them and there's other it's important to say there's other universities in this network we're just one of them and whether the first or the last it doesn't matter because they're all working towards the same end um and the myself james myself lorraine mark uh column particularly james and orna have been involved in a research project and uh, trying to tell the stories of some of these students, the scholars, and that's with some publications on that which have, which are really good, and they tell like a lot of the try to shine a light on the, the the lives of these people and what study means to them and how it can help them. Um, and you know, every individual story is, is different, and there's people coming from all parts of the world. And if you read the comments on the journal section, that I just make you despair, you know. <laughs> but uh, when you when you're when you're involved in it, and it's 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 been like it's it's a challenge to try and get these things up and running and help these people online. We're trying to we're posting people. It ain't even in lockdown. I don't know what it's going to be more difficult. But we were doing things like you know trying to get people train tickets people might have bank accounts and you can't get the money or you can't get them a bursary or trying to get them a laptop and like even trying to get people a bank account could be a challenge how do you get them how do you get some money to someone to get them on campus get them a bank account all this kind of stuff um and it kind of and then how can you how could you pay for a train ticket for somebody to get on campus for example remotely um, or a taxi and you start to think about and what kind of books do these people need and what kind of internet what kind of wi-fi and you start to see all these kind of frictions and things that students have to do just alone to get in the door you know and these are really exacerbated and highlighted for people that don't have any access to the ability to make money to have money to freedom to work that whose lives are controlled, they can't um, move about. They're stuck in a big, crazy system for years. And some of them might have, you know, they could, they're, they're certainly not here to, for some kind of holiday or something, you know. Uh, and it's there's actually <clears throat> a nice story, kind of maybe some parallels with your, your own, Ken, but it's always very hard. And it's a colleague of mine now who's from Syria. And, you know, he came here with his family, taught himself English, and um, he's working in the team now. And he's a, a former maths teacher, and he's did um, a course possibly under Springboard in NCI, and then he's doing a master's with us now under the University of Sanctuary Scholarship. Um, and him, and indeed in the team, 
we've had increasing number of non-Irish people, which is wonderful. You know, it's really good, and it's it's kind of um, it helped us a lot, and it, it kind of it shows up some things as well that we didn't know about ourselves that we have to do more work on, but. Um, it's hugely enriching as well to be able to work with people from different traditions, different faiths, different countries, different skin color, you know, and different. Uh, so it's it's um, it's been useful for us to learn and and um, uh, and there these you know the, the increasing diverse people are making great contributions to the team and it kind of brings it home to you because certainly for myself, unless I'm working or meeting people directly, I can't, it's hard to get an idea of what issues they're going through. Just that's a kind of limitation. It's possibly sort of human limitation, but when you actually meet people and you know them and you're working with them, it kind of all gets a lot more real, the big issues that are going on and about diversity. Look, I, 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 I think we had this conversation just before I started press recording, uh, record as well, and I, I'm only acutely aware of, um, I suppose, the life of privilege um, that that that's, uh, you, you take for granted, um, and you know, even the, the some of the simplest things like you mentioned there, um, Sharon Flynn, who we had on the podcast before, um, in as part of the IUA project, they've put out a, a brilliant series of vignettes from both students and lecturers. Uh, and one of the ones that really resonated with me was a, a, a young woman um, who's studying in UCC, but is in, uh, again, a sanctuary scholar, um, and was in the direct provision center in the Kinsale Road in Cork. And she filmed her short little vignette from there and spoke about the challenges of Wi-Fi and having room to study. And, and I remember thinking, yeah, these are things like that. You know, I, I might have had challenges over motivation and I might have had challenges over procrastination, but I didn't have challenges over, like, did I have the space to study? Did I have the device to study? Did I have books to study? Did I have um, the time to study, I guess? And, and, and that. so, yeah, I think... I'm acutely aware that we we, t we tend to see everything from our own perspective um, mm. and get and getting other eyes and perspectives and other stories and yeah. um, it, it's it's wonderfully enriching and and, and rewarding. Um, so yeah, no, it's it's great yeah. to hear about your work yeah. in that regard. And it, I mean, in the in terms of that, just something about the pandemic that kind of cued me there, Ken, when you were saying about these things, like the privileges that people enjoy and don't notice, you know, and like say some of my neighbors would have been worried about the leaving cert, not the, even the leaving cert, the kids aren't even doing leaving cert, they're just in secondary schools, in post-primary schools, and they were worried that they weren't going to have exams and they thought this was really annoying, right? <laughs> and like, you know, what a non-problem to have. Like my brother works in a desk school in Galway, and when that school closes, like those kids are going home to nothing. They need school. They need to get to school to try and find a good teacher who might teach them something. They're not going to get any of that at home. You know? So, and that's the kind of the very sad and challenging thing is that we need to be able to see not just to get out of our own kind of filter bubbles about that we're in this very privileged, um, safe world. Certainly, as a white man, a heteronormative white man, it doesn't. I, you know, I, I'm not. I can walk down the street at night and it doesn't, and I'm not going to feel um, afraid, you know. Um, so it's the kind of whole pandemic is, is it's a challenge that we need to meet as educators you know, as best way we can and by kind of trying to consider all of the problems that are still there and bring them as well and not just get too focused on um, or kind of have a wide focus, if you like, of what, are, of what we're trying to look at and see what the big big issues are that we can, we can talk about. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, um, you know, look, there's been, there's been lots of, and, and I suppose to, to finish up on, on, a, on a, maybe a, a more slightly upbeat note and, and maybe a, a call for action as well. I mean, look, there have been fantastic examples of people going above and beyond and doing brilliant work. Uh, as a result of the okay. pandemic uh, yeah. and uh, both from students and, and academic staff. Um, but uh, before we congratulate ourselves too much, um, I think the, 
the, the really interesting work that will come out of all of this is trying to find the areas um, where people were left behind. And I don't think there was a lot of people left behind, but there were some. Uh, mm-hmm. and, each, and, each, and each one of those uh, is an individual. And for them, it's, it's the totality of their experience. So uh, yeah. for them, I mean, it, it's, it's a 100% failure. And I think yeah, I mean, yeah. we, we, we need to be brave enough to, yeah. to, to, to examine that and I mean, ask the questions. There's one group as well, Ken, who's definitely been left behind, which is the Cork Hurlers. <laughs> yeah, for, for, for quite a number of years now. <laughs> um, look, you know, they're a marginalised group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I don't even... Look, the, the, the only thing I can say on that one, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll definitely finish up on this because yeah, yeah. we're talking for nearly 40 minutes, would you believe? Right, sorry. Um, as, as, as bad as... No, no, don't be sorry. I should be... It's, it's your time. I, um, no. I, I'm conscious of... Um, as bad as it is for the cork hurlers... Um, it's even worse for the Waterford hurlers. Um, so, oh, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, as a, yeah, yeah. Oh. As, a, as a Cork exile living um, uh, and working in Waterford, um, at least I can sort of say that, you know, in, in living memory, we've, we've, we've won all Ireland's. Um, so, you know. Um, yeah. Well, I t- we touched on a few depressing things, <laughs> but, but uh, we will, as Gil Scott Heron had said, we, we'll hopefully step outside on a brighter day and we'll meet up in Croke Park and we'll, the, uh, absolutely. The premier oh, take on the rebels again. Yes, I, 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 I've said this uh, every other week, so I'm just going to say it uh, again. Um, time definitely does fly when you're when you're having fun. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure for me, yeah. Doctor A- Doctor Eamon Costello from DCU. Thank you very much for your time. It was wonderful speaking with you, and I look forward to seeing you uh, in real life uh, when when this is all over. Gervin Mago, Ken, same here.